Last Saturday, a heartbreaking tragedy unfolded in Buffalo, New York, as a white supremacist carried out a targeted attack of prejudice, hatred, and terror, an attack of evil against a predominantly black community and took the lives of 10 people. Roberta Drury, Marcus Morrison, Andre McNeil, Aaron Salter, Geraldine Talley, Celestine Cheney, Hayward Patterson, Catherine Massey, Pearl Young, and Ruth Whitfield. Ecclesia, I invite you to join me in this prayer, one that has been dishearteningly evergreen, as we have prayed versions of it before in the aftermath of mass shootings in Parkland, Florida, in Charleston, in Sutherland Springs, for our own community at Santa Fe High School and elsewhere. I'll lead us to celebrant. We cry out in lament again and again and again. There seems no end. Lives ended, families shattered. How long must we wait? Spirit of hope, help us to see you. We grieve those lost and lift up those in mourning, the wounded, and a community navigating the aftermath of this latest terror. Spirit of mercy, pour upon all the broken places. You are the God who bore all violence for the sake of your beloved children. And we cry out for an end to this devastation. Spirit of strength, beat these swords into plowshares. We grieve the divisions in our midst, the discord which the enemy uses to distract and to numb. We continue to cry out, no more. Spirit of truth, may the deaf hear and the blind see, and may hardened hearts be made tender in these times of such pain and despair. Be a light to guide us in the darkness. Amen. And Ecclesia, as we do always, we hold this tension of death and resurrection in this season of Easter. Join us in this time of worship and join us in this time now of lament as the band leads. My feet are strong. My eyes are clear. I cannot see all the way from here. But on we go. the way and in his arms 
Hi, Ecclesia. It's great to be with you as we continue this series, listening to and hearing from the voices of women across Christianity. And I'm probably like a lot of you when I look at the arc of my life. I spent a lot of time in school and in seminary, but the people in my life who have been most fundamental to my spiritual formation have always been women. My mother, my grandmother, and now I learned so much from my 18-year-old and 15-year-old daughters. They're the folks for where spiritual life comes alive for me and and inform me. And so while I was in seminary, I had this really interesting arc in that after $100,000 of seminary education, the only people I had as professors were men. And I appreciate many of them for what they taught me, but there was something missing something crucial that was missing in what I learned and how I learned it, what became important. Because what happens with human beings is that if there is a voice left out, if there's someone missing at the table, that necessarily shapes and misshapes our understanding of the world. And all throughout Christian history, throughout our tradition, there have been faithful women who have spoken into who Christianity, who Christians are and how Christianity is shaped. There have been women teachers and leaders and saints. And and maybe I'm thinking about this particularly right now because this weekend, my oldest daughter graduated high school. And she has spent the last four years at a school here in Houston that we have loved called St. Agnes. And the thing about St. Agnes, I know some of you attended there as well, is that it's an all girls school and it's situated just across the parking lot from an all boys school, but it's, all girls, and our children wanted single gender education. But it wasn't until they started looking at schools that I determined to discover who St. Agnes was. 
Like I had no idea who she was. And, and so in honor of that graduation, I wanna tell you a little bit about St. Agnes. She did not have a long life. And before she was St. Agnes, she was just Agnes of Rome. And she was killed, some would say martyred, when she was 13. And the reason that she was killed is because she had the unfortunate accident of life of living during the Diocletian persecution. Throughout the history of Rome, as some of you will know, there were these persecutions of Christians. And one of those was a man, an emperor, Caesar, named Diocletian. And Diocletian first came into office with lots of reforms. He was the guy who organized the state, who tried to get all the Roman Empire on the same page. He was a military organizer organizer, an engineering organizer. He's the guy that you want to call and put in charge of a big project because he can get it done. But part of him getting it done was calling all Rome back to the old worship of the gods. And here's the fundamental problem that Rome had with Christianity. They thought Christians, they were called atheist because they didn't believe in the gods. They believed in one God. And so during the Diocletian persecution, somewhere between 3,000 and 3,500 Christians were killed. And one of those was St. Agnes. And Agnes was the daughter of a wealthy family. And because she was the daughter of a wealthy family, there were certain expectations on her life that she would marry aristocratically, that she would have a life of luxury, and Agnes didn't want any of that. By the time she was 13, she had decided that she was going to dedicate all of her life to God. Well, this did not sit well with the men in her city. So you've seen this in movies where young women have like a cotillion or a coming out ball where they are presented for marriage, and she didn't want to do that. And I know 13 sounds young to us. It definitely sounds young to me. But in the 300s, it wasn't all that odd. So she refused to marry because she had given her entire life to God. But this was the Christian God and not all the gods. So a group of men, including the local town's prefect's sons, went to Agnes's home, they stripped her naked, and walked her through the streets to be arrested and imprisoned. It's very much like something you might expect to see in Game of Thrones. And when she got to prison, they attempted to rape her. And as the story is told, as they were attempting to rape her, Agnes miraculously became covered with hair from head to toe. And, and the men who got closer, who tried to rape her, the story is told, automatically died, including the prefect's son. So the story goes that the prefect ended that whole rape scene and sent her off to another judge to make a decision about her life. And he did that she should be put to death. And this time she was stripped naked again and she was nailed to a wooden post with wood beneath her and they tried to set her on fire. And as the story goes, the fire didn't consume her at all. And frustrated, a guard watching over all of these events took out his sword and beheaded her. And that's the story of St. Agnes, 13 years old. And that's why St. Agnes is known as the patron saint of young girls and virgins. And I think her life, short as it was, some very important things to tell us about how we live our lives. The first is that worldly pursuits are not sustainable. 
And I don't know how you know that at 13. Like at 13, in our world, like that's all that you're after. Like, like you're trying to figure out eventually what am I going to do for a living? What's my life going to look like? What, what are the trends in clothing and food? What kind of experiences can I collect? But there's something about Agnes that very early on knew that dedication to God is the only thing that matters. And yes, I've got some pressures on me. I've got some stresses on me that are legitimate stressors, right? Like getting married is not ungodly. But she decided that her life was to be lived for God and only for God. And I don't know about you, Ecclesia, but as I get older, one of the things that I've noticed about my life is that so many things that I thought were important, that I thought were essential to having a good and flourishing life, they just aren't. Not only God matters. And when only God matters, I become a better husband and father and pastor and worker. Laser-like dedication to God. And this is why Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew that our call is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. Because when you do that, the rest of life begins to order itself. And so we need to move away from this aspect of ranking things that are important to us and focus on the Jesus revealed in Scripture and allow Jesus to rank the rest of life. The second thing, I think we learn that conviction is costly and maybe particularly costly for women in our world or the most vulnerable in our world. To say, I have dedicated my life to certain things and I am willing to accept the fallout if the world doesn't agree with those things. Like I know because I've talked with so many of you, particularly the women of Ecclesia who are interested in dating and maybe one day marrying, and you have some non-negotiables about the way you'll do that. And just about everybody in your world is hinting at or directly telling you that you should fudge on those non-negotiables, that you'll never find what you're looking for by being principled and honest and true. And Agnes says, even if I don't, my focus is on God, to living this life that God has called me to. This is why from the very beginning of the Christian story, we keep coming back to this idea of loving the Lord our God and having no other gods before God. I think third, and maybe this is the most important for some of us, is that God really does care about your body and about sexual abuse. So here's the thing about St. Agnes. She is not only the patron saint of young girls and virgins. She is the patron saint of the sexually abused. And when I hear a story about miraculous hair growth and potential rapists dying and people being set afire but not burning, I don't know that I'm ready to believe that the first time I hear it. But here's what I find interesting. Why does the church tell that story? Does the church tell that story because we have a history in our world of men who abuse women for their own aims and the church wants to make it clear that God covers you, that God is with you, that you are seen, 
and, and why you might not be able to escape all of the consequences of a broken world on this side of the cross that God is with you. This is the story in John when a woman is caught in adultery and she hasn't done anything that the man hasn't done. And we don't even know how she got there. It could have been a setup. John's not interested in telling us all of that, but what John is interested in telling us is that when Jesus arrives, Jesus protects women who have been sexually abused, women who have been used by the men in their lives. And that's what we need to know, Ecclesia, is as hard as the world can be and as out of step with who God calls all of us to be, that our friends, our neighbors, our loved ones can be, that the God in the scriptures, the Lord, the Messiah we find in the Bible, not only calls us to devotion, that in that devotion, he will protect us. And so may it be with you this week and forevermore that you know whatever you're facing, the Lord your God is with you in the flames. Let me pray for you. God, we thank you for stories that call us back to the heart of who you are inviting us to be. And we ask, Lord, that we inhabit these stories in a way that makes them real. God, in a way that brings us back to you. That we would look at someone like Agnes of Rome. I know that even at a very young age, even when we are up against the wall, regardless of our station in life, that you are always with us and you always have been. And we bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ecclesia, I want to invite you to the most sacred sacrament in the Christian church. And each week as we gather, we remind ourselves of the body and blood of Jesus. That on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. And in the same way, after the meal, he poured wine, saying, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. God, we thank you for your body broken and bloodshed that gives us new life and new strength each day that we are received by you just as we are today. And we are being transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ through your power and through your sacrifice. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Ecclesia benediction. God of all glory, may the boldness of your spirit transform us, the gentleness of your spirit direct us, and the limitless presence of your spirit be our strength. Lift us up and send us forth that we may be love and show love across every landscape and relationship and beyond every border. Help us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you, our God, that we might believe mightily, serve joyfully, hope divinely. Renew us so that we might participate alongside you as you renew all of creation, now and forever. Amen. Ecclesia family, dwell in peace.